seen in uh, uh, healthcare, uh, economics, management, etc. He is also in the editorial board of uh, the Journal of Judgment and Decision Making. I would like to thank both speakers for accepting to bring the eyes and uh, accepting to participate in our first uh, debate. And uh, let's please put our hands together again to welcome our speakers. Thank you. 
Afghanistan. I, I, I'd expect that most probably you just look at top two or three and it's very rarely go any, anywhere beyond that. Which makes me think that actually there is not much precision needed in, in solving this problem and finding all these probabilities to satisfy us as, as users of the web, as users of, of Google search. So it might be actually very, very easy to find a satisfying solution without huge effort, without over-optimizing. Uh, whenever I think of finding a satisfying solution, it always makes me, makes me think of, of a very good uh, Paul uh, Walter, uh, Sergei Vodka, who, uh, who created satisfying solution to, to perfection it, to the following point. He was beating the world record, and he did it 35 times in his research career. I think this was the best consultancy you can, you can offer to the crowds coming to the, to the stadium. Uh, he, over the years, improved the record by 40 centimeters, and he did it over the span of 11 years, improving it 35 times. So you, can, you, you may easily uh, judge that, on average, he was improving it by one centimeter. And, and I actually think that Usain Bolt is probably aiming at the same thing. That's why it's so difficult to get into some of the games. Uh, and and uh, because, because he would like to, to, to mimic it. Right. Is satisfying always good? Or are there situations where we need to do better? I actually think satisfying the, the, the needs is not always what we are after. We'd like to do better than that. Um, so, because I work at the, at the School of Mathematics, of course there is this appreciation for accuracy, precision, precision of thinking, precision of, of, of solution, solving problems. But um, we, we have to be realistic, this is not something that comes for free. And in particular, if you have problems which are really complicated, and we do face such problems frequently in our life, then uh, it may not be possible to solve them to a high degree of optimality. May I just mention discrete optimization, in which uh, problems usually are so complicated that there's no hope to, to solve them to optimality. We have to rely on heuristics. It's great if there are some bounds on these heuristics, but even, even in many situations we cannot, we cannot benefit from that. And on the other hand, there is this other side of optimization, continuous optimization, where people study, study convergence, complexity, and sometimes can, can you give guarantees of how quickly uh, you will find that type of uh, good solution. Uh, here I'd like to draw your attention to the fact of accuracy that one might ask for in optimization, because people frequently say, oh, there is a, there's a quick algorithm, it's that we'll find epsilon optimal solution, where epsilon is some relative uh, op uh, value of the, uh, of the error in the objective, guaranteed error in the objective. And then there are different classes of methods. For example, the first order methods will require the number of iterations which is proportional. This calligraphic O means order of, which means proportional to. Uh, proportional to one over epsilon iterations. If you want just one digit exactly the solution, and I bet Google search does not give you more than one digit, probably gives you even less, but it perfectly satisfies your needs and, and my needs. So for one digit, only one over epsilon asks for ten iterations, but some methods have only this complexity and they will need more. There is this class of second order methods, in particular integral point methods, which are very good with this respect because they will need significantly fewer iterations to reach a guaranteed optimality. For one digit it's not important, but here is just two digits which corresponds to our commonly known 1% accuracy, uh, and already for 1% accuracy you can see the difference between these, these methods. If you want to go for more digits, it's of course becoming more hard. So, these first order methods might produce a rough approximation of the solution quickly, but they will struggle if you ever wanted them to, to give you an exact solution. Second order methods are better with this respect, they can deliver quality solutions. Um, and may I say, accuracy matters. It's, it's not something that is a, a purely mathematical concept, uh, because if we have constraints in, in, in our models, we sometimes really have to 
satisfy these constraints to perfection. Uh, think of budget constraints, the cash flow. Would you accept 1% error in it? There are people from the bank. Uh, would you accept 1% uh, error in the, in, the, in the cash flow of Royal Bank of Scotland? Of course not. There are physical bounds like capacity of pipes or, 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 or some other uh, tools that absolutely have to be respected. Or, or simply uh, a production model which from raw material produces something and again the balance has to be, has to be perfectly satisfied. So really good in this case would actually not be uh, just two digits but six digits. Uh, that's, that's what I would like to see. The, the bank operating in billions can allow themselves to make an error of order of thousands. Sometimes uh, we'd like the objective also to be to be perfectly optimized. And let me just give you a few examples where one percent would not quite quite satisfy me. This is, for example, a jet engine. Jet engines are are optimized to perfection, and uh, one percent less of fuel consumption on the flight on the cross Atlantic flight probably means well one ton or, or more of fuel. So this is this is paid in real life. Again, financial institution, 1% higher profit, they certainly will not uh, give up on that. And then ask uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer if he's ready to, to, to give up 1% of, of, of GDP growth. Of course, he's not. So 1% is not good enough as this objective is concerned. We need more than that. Now, recently we've seen this explosion uh, from coming from machine learning and, 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 and I'd like just to comment uh, on, on some of the very very typical problems that, that we face here and the solution method that we might be using. This is the support vector machine. So it originates from statistics and it is supposed to provide a separation. You can, I, I, I hope you can see the separation line between good guys and bad guys. So you have a big database. There was a fantastic talk yesterday by, by Andrew, the, the, the plenary, uh, saying about how important it is to detect fraud transactions on credit cards, and this is actually a bad transaction or a good transaction. This should be done instantaneously. There are lots of, lots of applications like this. They, they come from credit scoring, detecting fraud transactions, or telecom is interested in this. When you, as the user of the line, might start to consider switching to another operator. They don't want you. To, to lose you. So they would like to spot when, when is this moment that they should send you a new offer uh, of, of a better deal so that you stay with them. Well, good and bad cannot always be perfectly separated. Life is more complicated than that. You frequently see that there are some bad guys among the good ones and some good guys among the bad ones. And uh, also the separation, why separation should be given by a straightforward line. We may need some mathematics here to come with help and transform this data space to such a space in which linear separation will become possible. For certain problems it's possible to guess this, this function p that would guarantee this, but it's not always easy to do that. Well, there are situations in optimization where actually oversolving is wrong. And in these uh, problems like credit scoring or, uh, or signal or image processing, uh, oversolving may be dangerous. And why is it so? Because there's a lot of noise in data. It just means that yeah, uh, there, is, there is a lot of uh, noise in the, in the data. And then, if you try to, to, to solve the problem to a higher accuracy, you just amplify the, the noise and pay, pay too much attention. Yes. 
behavioral elements. Why is it so? It's something like the principal component analysis in stats, where you would like to know what is really influ influencing the, 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 the variable that you want to observe. And you would like this number of, of observations that you have to pay attention to to be small. These problems occur frequently in, in signal processing, in uh, machine learning, in, in data mining, and, and I actually think that uh, credit scoring problems, if they are formalized uh, mathematically, they also rely on, on a very similar concept. This is something called LASSO, and it asks for minimizing the, the error in the equation, but minimizing it in such a way that at the same time vector x has as few non-zero entries as possible. Uh, this is very functional in compressed sensing. And compressed sensing is something that you might have experienced when you were entering this room and you could listen to, to the pedal. It was, it was a very good recording. It was completely uh, noise-free. So compressed sensing is a, is a subject which tries to analyze signals and filter out uh, the error from it. Or a noise from uh, Here's an example, uh, very important for military applications. You'd like to uh, you, you, you study radio frequency of uh, radar phones, and there are impulses which you would like to pick up because, because a submarine of unfriendly, uh, our friend, un unfriendly fleet is, is approaching our territory or, or, or our ship. So here's, here's an example where optimization with the first order method and second order. Uh, words. Uh, this one is slightly faster, but in, in this case, the difficulty was that the signal to noise ratio will determine how easy it is to, 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 to find the signal. If the signal is much stronger than the noise, you intuitively expect it to be easy to find. If the signal is weak compared to the noise, then, then it's very difficult to pick it up from the, from the background. And there were two, two peaks here in this slide. Um, we all enjoyed uh, the, the World Cup this year. So here's an example. Uh, this is uh, the very special camera, so-called one pixel camera, that you might use if you want to send uh, pictures to a very far distance. For example, you want to send a signal to the end of the solar system, to one of the, well, of the spacecrafts going there, then, then it costs the energy, it costs uh, a lot of effort to do it, so you'd like to compress the signal as well as you can. We all enjoy compression of uh, pictures in JPEG format. We all enjoy compression of, of uh, sound in MP3 and MP4 formats. That's, that's exactly how, how it is done. But I think nowadays, what I can see, and I can see it also at this conference, there's this issue of optimization, how this will uh, tackle the, the big data problems. So I can certainly see that there are new problems for optimization in business analytics. Uh, problem size matters, problems are getting larger and larger. Uh, I would say solution accuracy is, is a frequently very important issue, but reliability of, of the solution method is even more important. Uh, frequently we'd like to have quick answers, it's just like Google search, answering instantaneously, or let me refer once again to the talk of yesterday, uh, 40 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds to answer to, to give an answer whether a hidden transaction on a credit card is, is fraud or genuine. Uh, so I think all our optimization can help greatly in this. And that's my final point, is good enough, good enough. No, I don't think so. I'd like the, the good to be uh, as good as, it's, as, as you can make it, and it should be almost perfect. Uh, so, conclusion, uh, go for optimality.
purposes, right? I find it with great interest uh, the funding of behavioral art uh, on, uh, on Tuesday night. I, I just thought what I got out of it was that a lot of it was focusing on descriptive purposes, but this talk is going to show how we can get ideas from behavioral decision theory and improve prescriptions. Um, I'm going to start by putting myself in the corner a little bit and actually argue for something stronger than what is in the debate. So I'm going to argue, I'm going to present an example called experiment according to which, uh, in which you can see that good enough can be better than best. So I'm really not kidding, I think it's possible, let me illustrate. Uh, let's say you want to rent a studio apartment. Uh, the way you would reasonably make this choice would be based on the attributes of these two possibilities. So this is an example of different attributes, rent, distance to the city center, access to the garden, and so on. Now, the common wisdom within uh, operations research is that this be model has a multi-attribute choice problem, and furthermore, that an optimization approach is taken. So what does that mean? You have to choose this apartment, which is best for you, and best means the apartment that maximizes your utility. So, the first point I want to clarify is that these three terms, best, maximize, and utility, only have meaning within a particular optimization model of this problem. And this is how this model can look. First, we have to do the, the sensible thing of scaling the attributes so they are on the same scale. Here would be the close 0 1 interval. Second, we, have, we, we need to somehow elicit the utility function of the decision maker. And let's say that this is what we come up with. And then after we do this, of course, it's, in this case, it's trivial to identify the, the best alternative, but even more generally, there are many techniques in which we can do it for more complicated problems. So in this case, this is what will happen. The best apartment, quote unquote, will be the one that optimizes your utility. So it's one that optimizes a model. On the other hand, it's also possible so what do I mean here? This is where we start getting into behavioral territory. You may end up choosing the other apartment. The other apartment may be what could be called a satisfying or a good enough apartment. So what does that mean? Uh, I will not attempt exactly to give a precise definition of satisfying. Uh, Herbert Simon introduced the term. It's a word that comes from Scottish and he brought it back uh, to life. Uh, and there are many definitions after that, but I will give you a gist of what I think this kind of thing should include. So, I think the most important thing is that you do not try to optimize a model. You do not have a model and you do not try to optimize it. Rather, you arrive at your decision by different means. So what could these means be? Let's, let's get back to speed. First, it could be exactly that you simply know that an apartment which uh, has a rent less than 1,000 pounds and it's uh, not more than, uh, it's, it's less than 10 kilometers from the city center, is good enough for you. You will be happy in that apartment, no matter what else happens, no matter if it doesn't have access to a garden, no matter this, no matter that. So you are satisfying. Uh, you simply create a, a very simple rule that, uh, and as long as an alternative is found that exceeds your aspirations and attributes, that are important for you, you simply pick, pick that alternative without doing any more complex calculations. You could also be that you use some social information to pick this alternative. So a friend of yours happens to live in the same building, in the same neighborhood, and tells you you really like it here, trust me. Or it could also be that somehow you get the gut feeling that you should do this. I'm not defending that all of these reasons will always lead you to a good alternative, but I'm just saying. It's a different way of doing it. It's a different way of choosing something rather than optimizing a model. You simply go directly to the reality and you use some very, uh, some very simple computations. To recap, somewhat of a definition of uh, satisfied would be that you pick, uh, that you choose something without trying to optimize. You do not necessarily consider other alternatives. If this was the first uh, apartment that you saw, you would go for it without comparing it to other alternatives. And uh, third, the, the rules, the formal rules, the mathematics involved, they're very simple. In this case, they only involve comparing the values of attributes on the aspiration levels on these attributes. Let me remind you that the other apartment will be the optimizing apartment, and it stands to reason, if 
you don't see that it's not really certainly possible. But in this case, the satisfying the satisfying apartment is better for you than optimizing your apartment. Ergo, this is exactly the, the sense in which I wanted to say that good enough can be better than best. So far, we don't really have an agreement. We don't have a disagreement with Yasef. We, we both agree that this can happen. And I think the intellectual interest and in practical relevant question is the condition under which you get good enough being uh, better than best. So this is exactly what I'm going to build my path in my, my argument for, for my side. So let me recap it and then I'm going to go through the moves. So the first thing that I'll do is exactly briefly discuss somewhat informally some of the formal conditions that we do have under which good enough for soul, empirically and analytically to be better than best. And this is exactly the hook to, to be herald or are, I would say. This is a quite lively area of research which is exactly in the intersection of OR techniques and behavioral science. So getting ideas from behavioral sciences like psychology, economics, management, and so on about the simple rules of thumb that people use, then we take these rules, we formalize them, and then we run a model competition with models that are being optimized to see which ones are better. And I think it's very important to notice that we always start to do this with real data, in real world. And if possible, of course, in relevant problems. Uh, so this is a quantitative comparison. And I also want to emphasize that this is a way in which this behavioral approach goes further than the standard demonstration of behavioral biases, which is usually inside the lab. Uh, the second part of my argument would be that after I've done the first, and I've given you some indication of the condition, I'm going to try to combine this with the Kinefin framework, which is a well -sword meaning habitat of familiarity, due to Dan Snowden, and recently have been argued that it would be useful uh, for understanding and articulating the different similarities in decision-making problems. I'll try to put those things together, the, the formal work in the first and the conceptual of this thing, and then suggest that what they together imply is that best, the good enough, better than best, in many kinds of important problems. So I think this is the main the main difference with, uh, with Jacek, because he was trying to, to go to the other side, to say that this, of course, happens, but it doesn't happen in many problems. <laughs> that's, that's how I read what he said. Um, and finally, I think you would all agree, if you were able to demonstrate reasonably, because you don't give a proof, but if there was some kind of reasonable demonstration, that uh, I'll, I'll be here according to two, that uh, good enough is often uh, or in many kinds of problems better than best, then you, you will have to accept that also good enough is, in a sense, good enough. So, let me, let me give you some examples about these conditions. I'm not even going to have much math, although all of them do exist, I can, I can point them to you. Uh, so I'm going to do it by example. So, but I want to say first that at, at a quite high level of abstraction, the conditions under which satisfying cannot perform optimizing, and vice versa, they're quite intuitive. For example, at high level of abstraction, usually what you could say is that if you have enough data and of high quality to represent reality well, then you should optimize. But if you do not, then you may be better to go with satisfies. So our institute was involved in a collaboration with the Bank of England, which had exactly the question that you see in this slide. We were interested in the comparative efficacy of optimizing and satisfying approaches for flagging those banks that are at the risk of failing in the future. And failing means that they go bankrupt and have to close down, or before that actually they have to be bailed out, but still then there's a cost to society, of course. Um, to find out, we uh, tested two, two, two models. Uh, in the database of all these global banks that had at least 100 billion of assets by the end of 2006, and then we knew after the fact that uh, about one third of those shells and two thirds of those survival tests. The representative optimization is logistic regression, and this is a strategic choice. I'm not arguing that this would be the best way of doing this. I'm well aware that there are many machine learning algorithms that perhaps could improve on accuracy, but this is what economists currently do. So the tool that financial regulators have, in fact, for intuiting what's going to happen or arguing or debating, is based on logistic regression that economists run in the journey. Uh, and the representative of a satisfying is uh, what we call a partial frugal gene. And this is how it looked in this case. 
an instance of it. So one of our colleagues in the bank, an economist, developed this back into the economic knowledge and intuition. Um, let's see, why do I call that a satisfizer? It uses a number of attributes, of course. It doesn't use too many. It's a nervous simplification. Uh, it doesn't use them all at the same time. It uses them sequentially. And each time one attribute is queried by a very simple operation, by simply comparing the value of the bank on that attribute with the threshold, then you make a decision immediately. So there's a lot of elements of simplicity and satisfying and not comparing alternatives or values in an optimizing way. Um, except for uh, this specific intuitive path of the field, we also had another brain uh, branch of path of the field, which are cross statistical because they were induced for data by using uh, cross validation. But in a sense, they're also satisfying in the sense that you have to get the sequencer, and at every time you have to describe the domain categorization. And uh, you always do that by a simple uh, comparison and comparison. So, what happened? These are the results. Um, if you look at the, at the green dot, the green, uh, the cross, this is the intuitive statistic, the intuitive fast information. The white circles are optimizing, and the red uh, triangles are satisfying. Uh, as probably all of you know, the more we move that direction, we increase hits and we decrease loss and runs. Therefore, this is what we want to do, and moving that direction improves our performance. Uh, a few observations. So, actually, it's interesting that uh, the, the, the green, uh, the intuitive faster to the green cross, is on the efficient frontier. There's not a point that is uh, on the top and to the left. Furthermore, though, the, the new score uh, overall, if you look at it in most cases without trying to give you the quantitative, uh, if you look at it overall, this is a situation in which optimization is in fact favored in the sense that overall the white circles lie above the red triangles. On the other hand, when we did, when we provided more impolarized data to the two models, so when we tried to simulate a situation that we don't know enough to represent reality well in the model, this picture is actually changed. So this is here. So now you see that uh, at least in some parts of the space, the red triangle, the satisfying approach, slide on the optimizing approach. So this was an illustration of the general factor I was telling you before, the intuitive fact that if you have uh, a good amount of high quality data, you can optimize otherwise, it, it should satisfy. Uh, before I give you another example, uh, which will also illustrate the conditions, let me go to the Kinetic framework and try to put it together with some kind of informal arguments, but I think reasonable ones. So, to do this, I will, I will first uh, oversimplify Kinetic. So, what I think this diagram says is as we move from simple to complicated, complex, and chaotic problems, what happens is that we don't understand the causal, the causal texture of the world very well. Uh, we don't have very good models for representing reality. So, if, if, that, if that's what you think is the same, then one, one also might expect that why, as we move like this, then there will be an advantage of satisfying. Let's try to anchor this to what we just said uh, with the example of the bank failure. I would argue that the bank failure example is a complex or complicated example. It's definitely not simple. Nobody really knows why banks fail. On the other hand, it's not completely chaotic. There are some statistical irregularities, and at least after the fact, uh, you, can, uh, you can construct an explanation that you're happy with why one particular part fails. It's not always true, it is after the fact, but you can do it. Yes?
some prior uh, criteria, and this criteria was very different from, from the criteria used to, to choose the so-called best solution. I don't have a particular to, 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 to really get into that, but I would still say that, you know, best is optimizing a model. Of course, if you know your correct model or the correct model of the world, nothing can be best, it can just be as good as good as best is. The example that Martin was meant to say that if you don't know your own model, and I think I saw the example with our partner because I think it's easy to anticipate that you do not really know the exact way. So in this case, you, you, you could mislead yourself by going to the test. I, I could I accept that sometimes you don't mislead yourself with any test with tests. That's, that's, that's fine. I think actually Herbert Sam was also quoted as saying that nobody would choose not to take the optimal if they actually knew it. Uh, getting back to my point, I would say that we're somewhere around here, and I try to illustrate the problem with an example, that for these kinds of problems, either can happen, optimizing can be better, or satisfying can perform better. Uh, and I'm going to uh, finish the talk by saying something about chaotic and something about uh, simple problems. So this is an example of what I would call a chaotic problem, in the sense that it's a serious lack of data for building a model. So the situation here is that the decision maker is a soldier. He's staying in a checkpoint in, in, uh, in this case in Afghanistan. And when the, uh, an oncoming vehicle is coming, they have to decide very quickly, of course, whether it's hostile or non hostile. And they have to take a series of actions, escalate force, and then in the end uh, make the right decision, which could be uh, which could also include the shooting at the car, shooting at the driver or, or the, the passengers in the car. So, why is this a problem with serious lack of data? First, the suicide attacks, one of the two possible events, is very, very rare. It's very hard if you interpret probability in the frequent this way to build a reliable estimate of it. It's not clear to me how you would build a subjective probability which would be in some sense accurate. Furthermore, the nature of the problem is that whenever suicide attacks happen, they're few, but still you would be hoping to learn something from them whenever they do happen. And it's not the case in this specific problem. Uh, when my student Nicholas Keller and I looked at WikiLeaks data for 1,060 incidents in Afghanistan from 2004 to 2009, we found out only seven suicide attacks. And the references of these seven suicide attacks include basically almost no information. They only discuss battle damage and not the attributes of the, of the hostile people. Um, in that sense, it's just really not clear to me how you could induce one of the trees that the optimizing approach would go for, as for example, prime and classification and regression trees, or the SVMs for that matter. So I would say that in this case, satisfying is not simply, the question is what, not whether it's a good enough option, but it's actually only, it's the only option. And what we should do to find out if we want to take it seriously is to compare it to what uh, as you have it so far according to the behavior of the soldiers. In this case, we know because there are the records. So that's exactly what we did. Again, I represent this uh, satisfying rule as a fastest food of tree. Uh, we did this independently of the data. We didn't fit the data to it, but rather we interviewed the experts, we scanned the literature, we used common sense, and Nicholas and I came up uh, with this tree. So, how did it do? This is the test. As I said, I think the reasonable uh, external benchmark here is behavior without the tree. And this is on the rightmost column. Broken down by the different types of people, but we can look at the total. So what happened there was 204 civilian casualties. And those are civilians injured or killed. Uh, but they were injured. We, we can know this after the fact. What we came up with being applied, you would have had uh, uh, savings of about 60%. Okay, finally, let me get, go back to the simple problems. An example of this, I think, relatively simple problem decision making is uh, the multi argument choice, the multi apartment choice. And uh, in a simple case, a simple case would be one where you actually know the utility function. Uh, 
And it turned out that we didn't use a satisfying signal approach, we just looked at the road layer. And uh, changed the road layer, changed the signage, uh, and that solved the problem. And really, what I want to say is that that may not be a universal solution, but I, I just point out that sometimes we can be optimizing the